All righty. Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, November 30th. Uh, we are rapidly, rapidly approaching the end. We've got a couple more lectures left to give starting today. We'll finish off the male reproductive system and then move on to the female. I have a handful of assignments left, two more labsters and one more unit review. Uh, remember for those labsters, complete them as many times as you need to. Just make sure you get it 100% complete and at least 80% correct for full credit. And then it's all tests all the time. Thursday the 9th, we have a lab and lecture exam. Again, you've taken those, you know what to expect from that. And then as we've talked about on Tuesday the 14th, you have a 100 point, a 100 question, all multiple choice, cumulative final exam on everything you've covered in this class. All right, questions on any of that or anything else before we get started? All righty, excellent. Glasses are smudging and bugging the heck out of me. All right, we left off last time and we had spent all our time talking about uh, the testes, talking about sperm formation and maturation and everything that goes along with that. However, as we mentioned at the end of the last class, uh, the semen is not just the sperm. In fact, the sperm and the fluids that are made by the nurse cells and provided by the epididymis only make up about 5% of the volume of the ejaculate that is released uh, by a male. Uh, and the reason for that is because there are uh, accessory glands that play a role in making all of the substances that uh, their goal is the delivery, the maturation, the, uh, the uh, the uh, nourishment protection of the sperm so that those sperm can do their job of fertilizing the egg. Again, remember, uh, they can sit for months after uh, being formed, just hanging out there in the ampulla of the ductus deferens, waiting to be released and never participating in that swing swimming motion. So becoming active, starting swimming is an important function of those accessories. As we mentioned, it requires a tremendous amount of ATP. So we need nutrients for that. And uh, we want to stimulate a reverse peristalsis in the female's uh, reproductive tract to help to draw the sperm up towards where the egg will be for fertilization. Lastly, uh, as I think we've already talked about before in this class, the uh, vagina is a very hostile environment. Uh, again, it's a, a, a fun statement to say, but it is 100% uh, accurate. And more importantly, it is vital uh, because as we hinted at earlier, the female reproductive system is an open tract system, open to the entire abdominal pelvic cavity. So there need to be protections. And um, much of that protection comes in the form of an acid mantle. Uh, that is in there that helps to uh, discourage bacterial growth and other types of things from entering into that area. However, acidity also slows the uh, swimming motion of the sperm. So that same acidity that protects uh, the female also uh, can impair the function of the sperm. And so we need to help to neutralize that. So again, the sperm can uh, accomplish their goal. Now, as I mentioned, there are three types of accessory glands. Uh, here, this nice picture shows all three of them. Uh, we have the two paired, oh, that's a good color, green, seminal vesicles, or what are also known as the seminal glands, uh, located here at the back of the posterior and inferior part of the bladder, basically right next to the ampulla of the ductus deferens. And remember, we mentioned that their ducts come together to form the ejaculatory duct. Those two ejaculatory ducts feed into the prosthetic urethra, which is fo uh, formed by the second gland, uh, accessory gland in the male reproductive system, the prostate, a uh, donut shaped gland that wraps around the urethra at the base of the bladder. And then the third gland are the paired bulbal urethral glands or what are also known as the cowper glands. Uh, notice the uh, glandular secreting structure is actually located within the levator ani 
within the urogenital diaphragm. However, if you notice, their ducts project forward and they actually release their secretion into the spongy or the penile urethra. Uh, so they've got a kind of a unique uh, location there as well. I uh, noticed the largest of these are indeed the, well, actually probably the prostate is the largest, uh, but we've got these two paired large seminal vesicles located again, posterior and inferior of the bladder. They may not be the largest of the glands, but they do produce the most secretions. In fact, for the uh, ejaculate that is released by the male, it makes up about 70% of that semen. It produces a very thick, uh, very uh, uh, yellowish, alkalinish secretion. Of course, why do we want it to be alkaline? Because everything's acidic. Mm -hmm. To neutralize the acidity, absolutely. And there are many components, many, many components within uh, the fluid that is produced here. Let's talk about some of the obvious ones. Uh, fructose is an important substance that is in this seminal vesicle fluid. And why might that be important? Nourishment for the sperm. Exactly, right? It's a sugar source uh, uh, that is, can easily be broken down to produce ATP. Asorbic acid, that sounds familiar. What's the other name we use for asorbic acid? Isn't it vitamin C? Yeah. So obviously that's there so that the sperm don't catch a cold, right? No. No, actually, as it turns out, asorbic acid plays an important role in the starting of the swimming motion of the sperm. Uh, the secretions of the seminal vesicles have a coagulation enzyme in it. Why might that be important? So that way they don't clump up? Well, partially. In fact, it's the actual, the opposite. In this case, we want to. Basically, you want the semen to stay where you put it. Right. Again, remember the goal of uh, copulation, the goal of this ejaculate is to fertilize the egg. So when the semen is presented to the vaginal canal, uh, we want it to stay in the vaginal canal so that the sperm have the opportunity to be able to try to reach their destination and fertilize that egg. Uh, so if it was not, didn't have that thick uh, and sticky uh, consistency to it, then uh, it wouldn't be able to stay present in the vaginal canal for as long and uh, would make it harder for the sperm to reach their destination. Here's one of the interesting uh, con con uh, components, uh, prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are a hormone uh, that is actually released in the secretion. Normally we think of uh, hormones being released into the interstitial fluid and circulating within our blood. But in this case, the goal isn't to get these prostaglandins into the male's blood. The goal is to get these prostaglandins into the females. Uh, prostaglandins produce a reverse peristalsis. In the female's reproductive tract, which in fairness we haven't talked about yet, there are weak peristaltic uh, contractions that help to move any type of substances or any type of secretions out of the uterus and out of the vaginal canal. Because again, anything that gets caught in that mucus, anything harmful and damaging, we want to remove. What these prostaglandins do is produce a reverse peristalsis, helping to draw the sperm up the vaginal canal and up the uterus towards the uterine tube, because it's actually in the uterine tube where fertilization will take place. Uh, one of the interesting things about these prostaglandins is uh, there's two things. Uh, one, um, one of the things that when you're pregnant, the doctors warn you about is starting about the seventh month of pregnancy, you have to be really, really careful about having sex uh, because both the prostaglandins that can be produced uh, that are released in the semen, but also a female orgasm can produce these reverse peristaltic contractions. And these contractions of the uterus can actually stimulate that positive feedback process that can lead to uh, labor and delivery, which obviously at seven months of pregnancy, you don't want to have happen. However, the flip side of that is there, all, there is the old wives tale that if you have gone past your due date, 
All right. Sometimes those old wives get things right. And there's this old saying that what got you into the mess can get you out of the mess, basically meaning having sex got you pregnant. So having sex can get you out of being pregnant. And it's exactly for this reason, having sex past the due date, again, whether it's the orgasm of the female or whether it's the prostaglandins of the semen can trigger contractions of the uterus that can induce labor. All right, like I said, there are dozens of components to these secretions. And basically they serve one of three processes as we've seen, protection of the sperm, providing nutrients for the sperm to function or playing a role in activating that sperm. Again, if we were to just pull a sperm out of the ductus deferens and slap it on an egg, it's not gonna be able to fertilize it. It has to become activated or capacitated. And that's this term, capacitation, is that activation of the sperm. So not only is it in a functioning with its spinning motion, but it's actually capable of fertilizing the egg. And again, these are things we don't want to happen until the sperm is being released. And so not surprisingly, it's within these accessory gland secretions where these substances are produced. Our second gland, as I mentioned, is a prostate gland. Notice, as we talked about before, with these seminal vesicles, they have a single duct. Actually, let's make this a little bigger, it's easier to see. A single duct coming out of them that feed into and meet up with the ducts of the ductus deferens, which, as we talked about, come together to form the ejaculatory ducts. So we have two ductus deferens, we have two uh, seminal vesicles, and we have two ejaculatory ducts. This prostate, as I mentioned, is a donut-shaped gland that wraps around the urethra that actually has dozens of uh, ducts coming out of it. If you notice in this cut illustration, it appears to have a striped appearance to this prostate. And that is because of the many, many ducts that feed out of the prostate into the prosthetic urethra. So there isn't just a single duct that comes out of the prostate. There are many, many ducts that feed out of it. So it gives it, again, that very uh, striped appearance. And again, it encircles the urethra. Um, it produces around 30% of the ejaculate, producing, again, a very uh, a whitish, milky fluid that, again, has dozens of components to them. And rather than rattle, rattling off a list of chemicals, just know that most of these play a role Again, in activating the sperm, getting the sperm swimming and ready to fertilize that egg. Uh, again, the prostate is probably best known, not necessarily as its role in forming the ejaculate, but because uh, basically as uh, the um, median life survival age has increased. More and more people are finding that if a male lives long enough, eventually he's gonna get prostate cancer. Now, for most uh, males that get it, especially at an older age, uh, pros most prostate uh, cancers are relatively slow growing cancers. And uh, again, when you get a slow growing cancer in your prostate at 85 years of age, you're probably more likely to die of something else than that prostate cancer. However, there are a rarer form, but more aggressive form of prostate cancer uh, that uh, is much more aggressive and not needs to be watched more closely. So starting typically around 45 to 50 years of age, uh, males have to have their prostate examined. How does that occur? Very pleasantly. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. Basically, if you look at this sagittal section, as you can see, the location of the prostate is in close proximity to the rectum. So basically what the doctor does 
is he inserts a digit in through the anus into the rectum where they can actually palpate the surface of the prostate. And they're checking for two things. They're checking the size to see if the prostate is enlarging. And they're also checking this, the surface. A smooth surface is a good sign, whereas if there are some rough bumps to it, that could be an indication of cancerous tumors. And as was mentioned, it is an incredibly pleasant and enjoyable experience. Okay, probably not. Uh, but that being said, uh, the prostate does have sensory receptors. And there are some individuals who actually find the uh, palpation of their prostate a very uh, erogenous experience. So uh, there is, uh, you know, no kink shame in here uh, to each his own. All right. Uh, the other way you may know about the prostate is it's practically impossible to watch sporting events these days without seeing some commercial involving prostate enlargement. If you remember when we talked about the urinary system, as we mentioned, when the internal urethral sphincter opens and the bladder starts to contract, urine will enter into the prosthetic urethra. Because remember, the external sphincter is located here in the urogenital diaphragm. And we mentioned how that sensation of the urine uh, within the prostate, uh, within the, that portion of the urethra, gives that sensation of the needing to void. Well, when the, if the prostate becomes enlarged, two things happen. That squeezing of the urethra irritates the lining of the urethra, giving the male the sensation that they need to void and void urgently. And do they necessarily need to at that point? No, not necessarily. And that enlargement also constricts the urethra so that even when they do need to void, voiding can be much more challenging, much more difficult to pass the urine, pass that enlargement and that restriction of the urethra. So you have the, that enlarged prostate, you feel like you have to void much more often and you're, it's much, much harder to get the urine out, which you can see could be a frustrating situation. All right, questions on that? The last two glands are the bulbourethral glands. Again, paired glands, They're the bellies of the glands, the secretory structures of the glands are located in the urogenital diaphragm. But as I mentioned, and as you can see from the illustration, their ducts actually project forward into the penile or the spongy or even the cavernous urethra, whatever you want to call it. Now, if we figure out the math from before, we said sperm makes up about 5%. The um, seminal fluid makes up close to 70%. The prostate makes close to 30%. We're already over 100% for the uh, total for our ejaculate, for the semen that is produced, right? So again, those math uh, a little bit, there's a little bit of fluctuations in there, but as you can see, we're already forming most of the ejaculate with those three components. And so it's not surprising that the bulbourethral glands don't so much produce a large component of the ejaculate themselves. The difference with these bulbourethral glands is they produce a very thick very viscous, very alkaline, mucousy secretion, and they produce it upon arousal. This is a pre-ejaculate that is produced prior to ejaculation. What is the function of this pre-ejaculate? Come on, it's bad enough I have to talk about these things with everybody's cameras off, so I can't see anybody's face, but you can all see mine. But you can at least interact with me. What's the point in the pre-ejaculate? Why would you want to produce a mucousy alkaline secretion prior to ejaculation? Is it to get the area prepared? And yeah. like this the sperm? It acts as a lubricant to help to facilitate copulation. It can help to neutralize the acidity not just of the vaginal canal, 
But remember in males, the urethra is a shared gland that not only the ejaculate has to pass through, but urine passes through as well. And if you remember, urine is usually acidic in nature. So by producing this pre-ejaculate, we can cleanse the urethra, or neutralize the acidity of the urethra, neutralize the acidity of the uh, vaginal canal, and help to facilitate copulation. Now, as I mentioned, uh, not surprisingly, upon arousal, this gland becomes active. But at the same time that these glands become active, there is also going to be minor peristaltic contractions within the urethra of the male and within the ductus deferens as well. So upon arousal, while the male is not producing semen, some sperm can be released into the urethra and can mix with this pre-ejaculate. In fact, in some instances, the concentration of sperm can be higher in the pre-ejaculate than it is in the ejaculate itself because it has less fluid within it. And so therefore, by, by, by concentration, more sperm, which is exactly why right, withdrawal is not a viable method of, uh, of uh, birth control. Right? Because even before ejaculation, the male is producing a pre-ejaculate secretion, and that secretion can have sperm in it. So withdrawal is not a valid form of birth control. All right. Questions on that? All right. You put it all together, uh, mix it with a spoon, and you get our ejaculate, that semen. As we mentioned, it is typically uh, basic to help to neutralize the acidity as a somewhat milky appearance. The average size of the ejaculate is not particularly large. Uh, typically about two to five milliliters of ejaculate is produced on average. And again, remember only about 5% of that is sperm. Uh, so notice if the male has a vasectomy is there typically a noticeable decrease in the size of the ejaculate that is produced? No. No, typically not. I mean, there's a minor decrease, but typically not much more than that. It typically isn't noticeable. While it may not seem like a large volume, it is incredibly impressive with the number of sperm that it contains. The average ejaculate contains somewhere between 20 and closer to 150 million sperm per milliliter. So with five milliliters of ejaculate at 150 million per milliliter, that is a whole lot of spermatozoa. And why do they need so many? Because many are gonna die off. Well, actually it's because none will ask for directions. All right, yes, actually, there's a tremendous attrition, as we'll see as it goes through. So much of attrition that having less than 25 million per milliliter is considered to have a low sperm count. And in fact, if you have less than 20 million sperm per milliliter, you are considered to be infertile. Think how crazy that is. You could have 15 million sperm per, per milliliter of your ejaculate. And medically, you are considered to be incapable of getting a female pregnant. Like I said, we'll talk about development. We'll talk about fertilization uh, next week. But uh, it is an impressive process. And as was mentioned, it's because there's a tremendous amount of attrition that takes place. That may be what leaves the male but that isn't anywhere near the numbers that reaches the egg. Now, notice here, typically with an average ejaculate, at least 60% of those sperm are fully functional and viable. So this is important if someone is attempting to get pregnant. If you are attempting to get pregnant, should you have sex five times a day for a month straight and hoping that one of those sperm will magically get to its destination? No. Why not? Sounds like a lot of fun. Why wouldn't you want to do that? 
Does the sperm count kind of go down every time the male ejaculate? It can go down, absolutely. And even if the numbers themselves go down, remember while they're in the epididymis and they're being maintained, remember we're also drawing out and removing some of the non-functional sperm. So even if the total number stays the same, the number that are not viable, the number that are not, I mean, the number that are viable, the number that are functional will, can drop significantly. So instead it's better that the male uh, uh, withhold sex for several days, uh, have sex, wait a couple days, have sex again, uh, to give time to not just produce uh, more sperm, but also to produce more viable sperm as well. Because it's not just about numbers, it's about having the numbers of functional sperm as well. Absolutely, excellent, thank you, Catherine. All right, that's probably everything you ever wanted to know and more about semen. Let's talk about that copulatory organ. Uh, again, that uh, penis serves two functions, a dual function, both uh, in the urinary system and in the reproductive system. And of course, as we all know, the average penis is 17 inches long, thick as a soup can and jointed twice, right? Prehensile can wrap around limbs and things along those lines. Yep. <laughs> um, if we were to uh, talk about the penis, the penis has several main regions to it. It has the shaft or what is known as the body, and it has the enlarged head, which is the glands of the penis. This particular illustration doesn't show it, but there is also at birth a fold of skin that wraps around and protects and maintains the sensitivity of the glands, uh, what is called the prepuce, although it's more commonly known as what? Foreskin. Foreskin, absolutely. That foreskin is uh, often uh, removed shortly after birth or later uh, in the male's life. Uh, typically as a result of either medical decisions, religious or cultural decisions, different cultures, different religions, uh, different societies have different uh, expectations on whether or not the foreskin should be kept or not. Uh, if we look internally, which this allows us to see a little bit here, and then we see better in this longitudinal view, uh, there are three areas of erectile tissue, spongy erectile tissue. And just like that kitchen sponge, when you go to um, do the dishes, it's been sitting there on the counter for a couple of days. And when you put it in water, it absorbs that water and expands. And that is what basically these three spongy uh, erectile tissue areas do as well. Uh, notice here in a cross section, we can see the relationship of these areas better. Uh, the first of these erectile tissue areas is what is known as the corpus spongiosum, shown here in red. Notice this is a small layer of erectile tissue that actually wraps around the urethra as it passes through the penis. Why might it be important to have this erectile tissue wrapped around uh, the head of the penis? And I mean the, the urethra of the penis. So it doesn't collapse? Exactly, right? Uh, copulation, when done properly, should be vigorous, right? But again, remember the goal of copulation is fertilization. And so it doesn't do any good for the copulation to take place if the urethra collapses during that process and the ejaculate isn't capable of being released, right? So by having this bit of erectile tissue wrapped around it helps to allow that to occur. However, notice the largest areas, oh, let's usually do this, uh, for that corpus spongiosum, and again, here we see the urethra passing through it, in this longitudinal view, it has two enlargements to it. Distally, it enlarges to form the glands that we mentioned, the head of the penis, but it all, there is also a proximal enlargement. That proximal enlargement is known as the bulb, and it basically helps to attach the penis to the pubic symphysis. 
Notice it is through the bulb that the ducts of the bulbourethral gland pass through, which is now where you can see where it gets its name, bulbourethra. The duct goes through the bulb into the urethra. Uh, so that is where it gets its name. So it has those two enlargements, proximally the bulb and distally the glands. However, the far larger pieces of erectile tissue are what are known as the capora cavernosa. Capora, of course, is the plural of corpus. So the singular would be uh, corpus cavernosum, or collectively there, the two capora cavernosa, or what are also known as the dorsal bodies. Notice these are superior to the corpus spongiosum and also lateral. I know this looks a little bit like a face here, but what they're showing us here with these red uh, structures are indeed these deep arteries. These are the ones that are going to feed the blood into this tissue, causing it to expand like a sponge. Now, again, when I'm at the kitchen counter and I'm putting that sponge in the water and it fills up with um, water as a result of that, right? That sponge is bigger, but it's still pretty floppy. That wouldn't make a good copulatory organ by itself. So if you will notice, uh, while there is this erectile tissue surrounding the erectile tissue is this collagenous connective tissue. This collagenous connective tissue known as the tunica albigenia surrounds these erectile tissue structures and as they expand against that collagenous structure, co collagenous, yeah, not cartilage, cartilaginous, collagenous structure, then that is what causes it to become turgid and rigid. So this additional structure, it isn't just that it enlarges, but as it enlarges, it swells against this restrictive structure causing congestion. And that congestion is what gives the penis its rigidity. The corpa capora cavernosa are also specialized at the proximal end. Notice at the proximal end, they taper to form these two regions known as the crua. Crua is the plural, crus is the singular. And the two crua and the bulb collectively form what we call the root of the penis. And it is the root of the penis that connects the penis to the pubis, and as we can see, to the levator and eye muscle, to the urogenital diaphragm. All right. Questions on that? Nope, and notice this picture also does a nice job of showing a little bit of prepuce around the glands as well. Uh, what kind of tissue are those corpus carbonosum again? Uh, like the corpus spongiosum, they're the erectile tissue. If you notice, what they've done a nice job of showing with this particular illustration is the showing the tunica albigenia that forms kind of this mesh-like network around the erectile tissue, so that when the erectile tissue enlarges, it pushes against its border and it becomes congested. And when it becomes congested, it becomes more rigid and becomes turgid and becomes the copulatory organ that it needs to be. So all right. three structures, even though they're different colors on the illustration, that's just to represent that they are uh, you know, named different things, but they're both comprised of the same thing. They're both comprised of that a spongy erectile tissue. Okay, thank you. Yep, great question. Any others? All right, we've talked anatomy. Now let's talk function. And remember, if you think way back to 430, I think I used this and uh, it's a good mnemonic to help to remember some of the function associated with the reproductive system, point and shoot. What does this mnemonic mean? Anybody remember? 
P for parasympathetic and S for sympathetic. Absolutely. And correct. So parasympathetic and sympathetic. And the point is the erection. All right. So the formation of the erection, remember, is a parasympathetic reflex. Ejaculation, the shooting, is a sympathetic reflex. So when you think of the function of the male, right, just think of point and shoot, and that will remind you of what it was, how it functions. Remember, as we've talked about in 430, we mentioned how most blood vessels are controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. All right, so the ones going to our skin, to our muscles, to our heart, to our lungs, to our digestive system, so we can redirect the blood when we're active. Remember when we're at rest, 25% of the blood are going to the kidneys, but when I'm exercising, when I'm running from that bear with an ax, I need to send the blood to the skeletal muscle. I need to draw it away from the digestive system, or draw it away from the skin, and so on and so forth. However, the exception, if you remember, is the erectile tissue. And this is true in both uh, males and females. In males, that's in the penis. In females, it is in the clitoris and in the labia. So erectile tissue uh, receives input also from the parasympathetic nervous system. And again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but I know you're aware of this because I know like me, now that uh, COVID is starting to go away, although now we have the whole uh, you know, Omicron thing to worry about. But before that, uh, like me, I'm sure you were finally getting a chance to get out and date a little bit more. And like just the other night, I took that special boy out for that magical third date to that really nice restaurant. And of course, when you take that boy to the nice date at the, at, you know, the third date and that nice restaurant, right? when you're putting out that kind of cash, you expect something in return. And you know it. And of course, he knows it as well. And if he's a little too nervous because of that expectation, is he always able to rise to the occasion to give you what you need? No, because that nerves. Absolutely. So I'm sure you do what I do apply him with alcohol, and then he's going to be a little bit more relaxed and you can get what you need from him. All right. But don't take it too far because then you get that whole whiskey thing and that becomes a whole other issue. But <laughs> the point is that arousal, the erection is a parasympathetic reflex, right? So when they're nervous, when they're scared, obviously that bear with an ax comes in a room, you don't get a heart on as a result of that, right? When you're scared, when you're anxious, those things don't occur. So arousal is a parasympathetic reflex. And basically this parasympathetic reflex, it's a sacral reflex that uses those pelvic splanchnic nerves, if you remember. And basically it controls two things. It controls smooth muscle and it controls glands. So upon arousal, as we mentioned, when a male gets aroused, that arousal leads to the production of secretion uh, from the Cowper glands, the bulbourethral glands. That pre-ejaculate. But remember, it also is going to produce smooth muscle contractions. We are going to start to get weak peristaltic uh, contractions in the vas deferens and the urethra, which, like I said, can sneak some of the sperm into that pre-ejaculate. But the other where, place where it's going to affect smooth muscle is it leads to a dilation of the blood vessels in the erectile tissue. And when we get an increased blood flow 
to that tissue. And as we mentioned, it starts to push against that collagen uh, network. And when that happens, it becomes congested. When it becomes congested, this does two things. It makes the penis turgid, rigid, so that it can be a copulatory organ. But the other thing that it does is it compresses the veins that drain uh, the erectile tissue. And so that not only does the penis stay or become erect, but it stays erect uh, because of this. Now, normally, I spelled that wrong. Congesting an area with blood, is that necessarily a good thing? No. No, if you think in terms of muscles, right? If your muscles get congested with blood, they can't get the oxygen and the nutrients that they need. Some of the proteins can start to break down. And that's some of the things that lead to the soreness and the pain and the discomfort from working out, right? From getting that congested area. And the same thing is true here. Well, obviously uh, this is vital for copulation, right? Like they say in the commercials, if you stay rigid for four hours or more, see a doctor immediately. Having this area congested for a prolonged period of time can lead to uh, damage and injury. I make a point of emphasizing this because there is a, and I hate to use the term toy, uh, so there is a sexual device that some people will use where they basically take a ring and put it at the base of the penis. And the goal of that is to constrict these veins so that the blood doesn't drain from the penis so it can stay erect and hard for longer, right? Which is all great when you're trying to impress that female, but right, these things aren't all necessarily one size fit all. And if after copulation is done and it's still not able to drain the blood, what happens? They have to drain it for them. Exactly. The and you know how they do that? You go to the hospital and they take a large bore needle. They insert that needle into the erectile tissue and they draw out some of the blood. Not surprisingly, that is not a very enjoyable experience. Well, and that is the problem, Max, because remember, the other problem with damaging this tissue, whether it's from the lack of oxygen, whether it's from the needle extracting the blood, this is a very specialized tissue, kind of like muscle tissue or brain tissue or cardiac muscle tissue. And these tissues don't typically regenerate. Instead, they heal via fibrosis, where instead of healing by replacing the tissue with the same type of tissue, they replace it with a fibrous connective tissue. And is that fibrous connective tissue gonna work the same way that the erectile tissue did before it? No, and so you're absolutely correct. So it is, and that's why I said I'm so hesitant to use the term toy when talking about it, because it is actually an incredibly dangerous device uh, that can lead to permanent scarring and damage and lack of function as a result of it, right? Normally we think about as we learn how the body works, we can use it to our advantage, but sometimes that's taken uh, to the extreme and this would be a perfect example of that. All righty. So as I mentioned, on arousal, parasympathetic, right, point. It is a, oops, uh, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. It is a parasympathetic process. And like I said, it involves basically uh, two things, affecting smooth muscle and affecting the glands. In arousal, that is primarily the bulbourethral gland. For the smooth muscle contractions, again, wow, my spelling was horrible on this. Uh, the ductus deferens, especially in the ampulla and in the urethra themselves. Again, on arousal, these peristaltic contractions are weak, but they are still occurring. And obviously the most noticeable thing upon arousal is that dilation of the blood vessels, the engorgement of the tissue, and that compression of the veins that causes the rigidity of the 
penis to occur, making it a copulatory organ. All right. Questions on arousal. All right, then let's talk about ejaculation. Ejaculation is a sympathetic reflex controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And it is one that we may not have talked about on the first day of class, but is also an example of a positive feedback process. Right, we talked about birth, we talked about blood clotting, but ejaculation is also a positive feedback process as well. Uh, stimulation of the penis or other erogenous zones increases the sympathetic activation, which is increased by the um, stimulation, which increases the sympathetic activation, and this builds and builds and builds until finally ejaculation occurs. And not surprisingly, it involves two things. It involves glands and smooth muscle. Actually, I should probably put it in the same order just to emphasize the similarity. Smooth muscle and glands. In this case, the glands that are active upon ejaculation are the seminal vesicles. and the prostate. And those are the glands that become active. Again, we are gonna get contractions of the ductus deferens and the urethra, but now they're gonna be powerful Well, let's just say the ductus deferens. Right. Ductus deferens. So power, powerful contractions of those. Again, uh, ejaculation isn't like turn it on a faucet where it comes and then it stops. It is in a pulsatile nature as it is released. And another muscle contraction that takes place is the constriction of the internal urethral sphincter. My, why might we want to constrict the internal urethral sphincter upon ejaculation? Excellent, obviously we don't want to ejaculate and urinate at the same time, but is there another reason? Again, that is 100% legitimate, but what else? Well, it's actually so the, the opposite. Uh, yeah. So the opposite doesn't happen. You don't want the ejaculate going up into the bladder either, right? Because if you think about it, as it enters in the prostate, technically there's two places it could go. It could go up to the bladder or out the penis. We don't want the ejaculate to go up into the bladder. So by constricting that, it forces the ejaculate out the penis. Absolutely. So it does both those things. Excellent. There is a condition, I don't remember the name of it, where uh, there's males that when they ejaculate, that internal urethral sphincter doesn't close. And so all, if not most, if not all of the ejaculate actually goes up into the urethra, into the bladder, in which case it doesn't come out the penis and they can't, you know, fertilize, uh, well, they can't, uh, you know, procreate by, by copulation in that case. All righty, so there you go. I uh, wrote all over this, but let's, again, the tumescence, the erection, again, parasympathetic, arousal releases that nitric oxide, controls the smooth muscle, engorges the erectile tissue. Again, those collagen fibers stabilize the structure, making it rigid, right, and compresses those drainage veins to maintain the rigidity. And again, secretions are produced by the bulbar urethral glands. And it doesn't say it here, but let's not forget, we have those weak peristaltic 
contractions that are occurring in the urethra and the ductus deferens as well. Ejaculation, the shoot is a sympathetic reflex. Again, muscle contractions, contractions of the internal urethral sphincter, and these again are powerful. Constricting the internal urethral sphincter, keeping the urine from the semen, keeping the semen from the urine, and releasing the semen from the ductus deferens, uh, from the urethra, out of the male body. And again, oops, we don't have our glands here. Don't forget also glands. And in this case, it's the seminal vesicles and the prostate that are producing the secretion. Well, I guess uh, release the semen from the glands. I guess I did mention that there, but we can be more specific. Once ejaculation occurs for males, they then enter a state of detumescence. The same way that that increase in sympathetic nervous system can stop the erection from occurring the first time, right? This powerful sympathetic activation that causes the ejaculation also uh, inhibits the production of a second uh, erection and a second orgasm after the first. So males enter this, what is essentially a refractory period uh, known as detumescence. Again, this is not just because of the increased sympathetic activation, but let's think about what that sympathetic nervous system does. Whereas the um, parasympathetic dilates the blood vessels, bringing more blood to the area, uh, the sympathetic constricts the blood vessels. So less blood is going to the area. Uh, smooth muscle within the penis will contract within that, uh, within that collagenous connective tissue structure, helping to force those drainage veins open and draining the uh, blood from the penis. So we get that constriction of blood flow, constriction of the smooth muscles, uh, and that loss of blood from the penis and therefore the loss of the erection. And how long does detumescence last? Doesn't it depend? Yeah, it varies from person to person, from age to age, typically to about the end of an episode of Wheel of Time and then they're ready to go again. All right, questions on that? Professor, so the D2 message is not positive feedback, right? The only the Yes, the ejaculation is positive reflex. D2 mescence is not. No, basically, again, it, because of that increased activation of the sympathetic nervous system that caused the ejaculation, that leads to uh, the suppression of the parasympathetic and the draining of the penis. And so basically, you've got to bring the sympathetic down and raise the parasympathetic back up before a, a, you know arousal could occur again. Okay, thank you. Yep. And again, it varies from person to person, uh, right? Married, 52 kids. Uh, the tumescence period is about three months. All right. Questions on any of that? All right. Excellent. We did the fun stuff. Let's finish off with the regulatory stuff. How are we on time? Perfect. All right. We're going to go a little long on this part, but I want to finish off the boys uh, so that we can move on to the female version. All right. Let's talk about our uh, hormone production and our sperm production, because as I mentioned, the regulation of this is very, very straightforward. All right. What produces our androgens? Testes. Actually, let's do this this way. Okay, you're correct, it is the testes, uh, but we can probably be a little bit more specific than that, right? Is it the interstitial? Uh, hold on, hold on. Let's get to the whiteboard and let's do this right. All right. What is responsible for androgen production? You are correct, it occurs in the testes, but specifically what cells? 
interstitial. Excellent. So our interstitial cells are the ones that are responsible for producing our androgens. Excellent. What tells the interstitial cells to make androgens? Luteinizing hormone. Excellent. And what releases luteinizing hormone? The anterior pituitary. Excellent. So we have our anterior pituitary. That is responsible for releasing luteinizing hormone. Excellent. And luteinizing hormone basically targets those interstitial cells to produce androgens. Of course, what tells the anterior pituitary what to do? The hypothalamus. How does it tell the anterior pituitary to make luteinizing hormone? It releases the gonadotropin releasing hormone. Perfect. So our hypothalamus produces gonadotropin releasing hormone that tells the anterior pituitary to produce luteinizing hormone. That luteinizing hormone goes to the interstitial cells, tells the interstitial cells to make androgens. And typically how are androgen levels uh, maintained within the blood? How do we maintain uh, homeostasis of our androgens in our blood? So with the nurse cells? True, we'll get to the nurse cells in a second. But what did we say was the most common way we maintain levels of a hormone? And it's not follicle stimulating hormone, although we'll talk about that in a second. Is it through inhibin? We'll talk about inhibin in a minute as well. But when we talked about hormones in general, what did we say was the primary way we maintain appropriate levels of that hormone? Hormonally? <laughs> negative feedback, right? Do you remember the primary oh, yeah. is negative feedback? And in this case, the negative feedback mechanism we use is actually humoral. What does humoral mean again? Through liquids of the body. Well, something in the liquids of the body. And in this case, that something happens to be the androgens. The amount of androgens. It isn't that androgens directly affect the hypothalamus. It's that the hypothalamus is keeping track of how many androgens are in the blood. If there's not enough androgens in the blood, it releases more gonadotropin releasing hormone. It releases the anterior pituitary releases more luteinizing hormone. Our interstitial cells make more androgens and androgen levels go up. If there's too much androgens in the blood, our hypothalamus is counting them, sees there's too many, produces less gonadotropin releasing hormone. Uh, so the anterior pituitary releases less luteinizing hormone. With less luteinizing hormone, our, our interstitial cells produce less androgen and the levels come down. So it counts the hormones, but since they are in the blood, it's, it falls under humoral regulation? Correct, because remember, with follicle stimulating hormone, that chemical is turning a key in those cells of the uh, thyroid to produce more hormones. 
it is stimulating and it is directly affecting the cell. Androgens don't affect the hypothalamus, they're just counting how many are there. So it's the same way as counting how much glucose is in the blood to know how much insulin to release. Glucose doesn't stimulate insulin production. The cells are counting how much, ins how much glucose is in there and then making the appropriate amount based on that. So humoral, remember, is just counting the number of things that are in the blood. So in this case, we remember, as we mentioned, males don't really have a true hormone cycle. That's not entirely true. They do have a hormone cycle, but their hormone cycle is typically daily. Androgen levels are a little higher at the beginning of the day and a little lower at the end of the day. But pretty much once a male hits puberty, they reach a certain level of androgens and it basically stays there till, as we talked about, till 15 minutes after their death. So basically it's getting them at that level and pretty much keeping them at that level forever. It's about as simple as a process as can be. Again, where are the Volkswagen bugs? But there is another side to this equation as you guys have rightly pointed out. Because gonadotropin releasing hormones don't just tell the anterior pituitary to produce luteinizing hormone, what else does it tell the anterior pituitary to make? Follicle stimulating hormone. Excellent. And what does follicle stimulating hormone target? True, the testes, but again, we want to be more specific now. Is that the nurse cells? Okay. Bingo, the nurse cells. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the nurse cells to do two things. One of the things that the nurse cell does is the nurse cells. promote sperm formation and maturation, right? They are causing the spermatogonia to divide. They are well, so let's actually say it that way. They promote spermatogenesis. They make sperm. Remember, nurse cells also make our androgen binding proteins. But nurse cells make one other thing as well. As you guys mentioned, nurse cells also produce the hormone inhibin. Because remember, making sperm is good. That doesn't necessarily mean that making sperm faster is better. We want to control and make sure that the rate of spermatogenesis is appropriate. And that's what inhibin does. Inhibin is a regulatory protein. In this case, this hormone directly affects the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus, more the anterior pituitary, but also the hypothalamus. And inhibin actually decreases the production of our gonadotropin releasing hormone and also a follicle stimulating hormone and also luteinizing hormone to lesser of an extent. Notice this is what we were talking about before. This is hormonal control. 
there is the chemical that is telling these cells what to do. Testosterone doesn't tell the hypothalamus what to do. The hypothalamus just counts how much testosterone is there. Inhibin tells the anterior pituitary and tells the hypothalamus what to do. So notice if the nurse cells are being forced to produce sperm too quickly, they're gonna produce more inhibin, which stops the hypothalamus from releasing as much gonadotropin releasing hormone, decreases how much follicle stimulating hormone is released by the anterior pituitary, which means less stimulation and the nurse cells can make sperm slower. So these are very two very straightforward negative feedback processes. But one uses humoral control and one uses hormonal control. Questions on either of these? I like this picture because it's very simple and straightforward. Your book does the exact same thing. Again, we talked about androgens. We already know what our androgens do, but here's what we were talking about, right? The male production of sperm, the male production of androgens is basically a continuous process. A little bit of a minor fluctuation during the course of the day. Like I said, a little higher at the beginning of the day, a little lower at the end of the day, but we're talking about minor fluctuations from puberty to death. Is that what females' hormones do? They reach a point at puberty and pretty much stay there till the females die? No. No. Not only do they end at some point, menopause, but they also fluctuate wildly during that point as well. It is a much, much more complicated system. So our anterior pituitary is constantly being told to release luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the nurse cells to make our androgen binding protein, to make our sperm. Luteinizing hormone tells the interstitial cells to make testosterone. Nurse cells also produce inhibin. And I actually like this picture a little bit better. This is basically the one we just drew. All right, hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary to release luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Luteinizing hormone tells the interstitial cells to make testosterone, which has that negative feedback where it is humoral. It's just the numbers of androgens that is telling it what to do. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the nurse cells to make the proteins, to can cause spermatogenesis to occur, and to make inhibin. And inhibin tells the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus what to do. And as I mentioned, this one is hormonal control, where the actual hormone tells the anterior pituitary what to do. So it is a direct control. It is a hormonal control. Whereas like we said, the hypothalamus is just counting the number of androgens and deciding what it's doing based on the number that it counts. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. Then just that easily, we are done with the male version of the reproductive system. And so we can go ahead and take our first break, uh, come back after the break and move on to the females, which obviously is similar, but also slightly more complicated as well. Let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, we went a little long for this one, so we'll take a little bit of a longer break. Uh, come back in 20 minutes, come back at 1.40 and we will restart at that point and then I'll start the recording so we can come at this fresh. All right, 
any questions? All right, during the break, think and make sure if there's anything you don't understand about the boy version, because the boy version is the easy version. If the boy version doesn't make sense, it's just going to get worse when we talk about the females. So uh, take a look at this, think about this, and I'll see you after the break. All righty. So we have finished off the male reproductive system and we are on to the female reproductive system. Again, like there are some similarities. The primary organ is the gonad. In this case, it is the ovaries. And again, we have a ductwork system connecting uh, that uh, gonad to the outside world. And again, as we mentioned, this is an open duct system in females where it is closed in males. And those involve the uh, vaginal canal, the, the uterus, and then the uterine tubes. And we'll talk about the specializations of those in a moment. And then just as we finished off the males with the external genitalia, uh, we will do the same thing for females as well. Again, ovary is the primary reproductive organ. Uh, its functions include, just like the testis, the formation of gametes and also the production of our hormones. Uh, unlike the males that are outside the abdominal pelvic cavity, the females are inside the abdominal pelvic cavity and are located lateral to the uterus. They're held together by a collective of extensions of the uh, peritoneum uh, that both divide the peritoneal cavity both uh, into anterior and posterior portions inferiorly and collectively are known as the broad ligament. <laughs> Laterally, they are held in place by what are known as the suspensory ligaments. Between the ovaries and the uterine tube is the mesovarium. And then between the ovary and the uterus is the mesometrium. So now this is a lot of vocabulary. And again, you know how horrible my artistic skills are, but the uh, uterus is, a, especially in a woman who has never had a baby before, is about the size and shape of a pear. So something like that. And as we mentioned, uh, the ovaries are lateral to that. Coming off of the um, uterus are the uterine tubes that extend out and then drape over the top of this, I mean, that kind of looks like a weird moose, but that's horrible. But we get the, uh, hold on, let me do those again. I want to exaggerate that. All right, there we go. So, as I mentioned, we have the suspensory ligaments, which help to anchor the ovaries laterally against the wall. In the space between the ovary and the uterine tube is the mesometrium and that along with the, uh, here we go. Sorry, the mesoovarium uh, and then the mesometrium and the mesovarium form the uh, broad ligament. So again, I've done a horrible job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook, and this shows this better. Notice here, again, we have the medially located uterus, the ovaries lateral to the side. And as you can see, these are all loosely held in place by ligaments and extensions of the peritoneal cavity. So as I mentioned, we have the suspensory ligament, that anchors this all laterally. As I mentioned, uh, the mesovarium basically is an extension of the peritoneum found between the ovary and the uterine tube. And then the mesometrium is this big broad extension between the uterus and the ovary. There is also additionally an ovarian ligament that anchors it directly to the uterus. And notice this is a posterior view because on the anterior side, 
the round ligament extends out from the uterus to anchor uh, the uterus to the anterior part of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Again, the mesovarium and mesometrium collectively form this big extension of the abdominal pelvic cavity uh, that, or the peritoneum of the abdominal pelvic cavity uh, that divides it into an anterior and posterior pouch that we can see on the next picture. Notice with those ligaments with the uterus, we have these two inferior separate compartments of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Posteriorly, it is the rectouterine pouch, and anteriorly, it is the vesicouterine pouch. And why are all of these elaborate structures necessary to anchor the uterus and the uterine tubes and the ovary in place? Why do we need all of these things? Right? The kidney doesn't need this type of elaborate stuff. It's just anchored to the back wall. Right? The bladder doesn't. The stomach even doesn't have this much uh, holding it in place. Why is it necessary that the ovaries have this? And the uterus and the uterine tubes. Is it because they're smaller structures and so there's more space around them? They do start smaller, and then as Hannah pointed out, these have to expand. Remember, I mentioned the uterus in a female who has never been pregnant before is about the size and shape of a pear. Is that how big the uterus is going to be in week 49, uh, pardon me, week 39 of pregnancy? No, it's going to basically expand to hold a basketball. So there requires a tremendous amount of expansion. In fact, I didn't bother bringing it up ahead of time, but I'm sure it's there. There is a great uh, model, whoops, in the uh, chart, I should say, in the classroom. So if we look at, yeah, let's do this together. Again, that Cosumnes River College Virtual Anatomy Lab female reproductive models and charts. Here again is the model of a, a non-pregnant female. And there's all of this here. Notice is the chart showing the beginning of the development of the baby. And this is what it looks late term, right? Think about the tremendous amount of expansion and movement of these organs, the uterus and the uterine tubes and the ovaries, not to mention what's happening to the poor bladder that we see down here and all of those digestive organs that are being shoved to the side by this huge massive basketball that is expanding inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So I know it seems a little elaborate to have all of these structures in place to stabilize it and hold it in place, but we want to stabilize and hold it in place but also allow for that suspension and for that movement to take place as necessary during pregnancy. Excellent, and we did that and we did that. Obviously what we wanna spend most of our time talking about is this right here, the ovary. Again, like many of the organs we've talked about, it may not be too impressive to look at, it's only about two inches by one inch oval, uh, and it only weighs about a quarter of an ounce. But uh, like many things, it's more than what it looks like. It is an incredibly impressive organ uh, that is incredibly active and has a whole lot going on inside of it. Now, like the testis, it has two layers associated with it. Again, uh, unlike the testis, which is outside the abdominal pelvic cavity, so has that tunica vaginalis, which is that extension of the peritoneum on the outer surface. Here, it has the actual peritoneum on the outer surface. So this outer layer that we would call the visceral peritoneum, this is an intraperitoneal organ after all. But as we also know, anatomists love to name everything. So this exact same structure, we, which we could just as easily call the visceral peritoneum, 
we can also refer to as the germinal epithelium. Then, like the testis, it is filled on the inside with a fibrous whitish connective tissue. And this fibrous whitish connective tissue that forms the bulk of the ovary, just like we saw in the, tis in the testis, is also the tunica albigenia. Now, if you remember, there were extensions of the tunica albigenia in the males that formed individual lobules. That does not occur in the ovary. That doesn't mean that the ovary isn't um, compartmentalized. It is, but in much the same way that the kidney or the lymph node or some of the other structures we've seen that way are. It has a chewy nougat center and a candy coated outer shell, or it has an area that we refer to as the cortex and an area that we refer to as the medulla. Now, unlike the kidney, unlike the adrenal glands, where the borders of these are very distinct, here it is much more of a diffuse border. So there isn't a distinct line that separates the cortex from the medulla. It's much more uh, uh, vague than that. But as you can see from the illustration, there is definitely different stuff located inside of the cortex than there is in the medulla. The medulla basically is just this poorly defined area in the middle where you're going to have the blood vessels and the nerves that come into uh, the ovary. Whereas the cortex in the outer region has all of these structures that are known as the follicles. And the follicles are what associated with the maturation and release of the eggs, the uh, oocytes. Oops. Here we see an actual uh, 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 ovary. Uh, this one is actually from a cat, but again, it's still a real one. And again, we see that same uh, anatomy. We have that cork, that medulla in the center, uh, where again, there's the blood, big blood vessels and big nerves. And then on the outside in the cortex, we have in different stages of maturity, all of these follicles that are involved in the production of the hormones and the maturation and release of the eggs. Again, here we have the nice illustration. Again, that inner region, medulla, blood vessels and nerves, and the cortex, the outer region, which again, as I mentioned, contains our ovarian follicles. The follicles serve two purposes. The follicles make the hormones and they mature the eggs. Notice the key word I said there, mature the eggs. They don't make them. The eggs are actually made in the ovaries in utero, all right? Females being the overachievers that they are, they are actually, when they're inside mom developing, they're already working on the grandkids. So the process of forming the eggs actually starts in utero. So when a female is born, she's actually born with all the eggs she's ever going to have for her entire life. And so then the goal of the ovaries cortex is just to make the hormones and mature those eggs so they can be released for fertilization. A follicle, as we mentioned, these ovarian follicles is going to then at its center have an immature egg. Uh, that, if you remember when we talked about this in the endocrine system, we call an oocyte the same way that the immature sperm is a spermatocyte. And then it is going to be surrounded by support cells. And those support cells basically come in two types. There are the inactive squamous cells. These inactive squamous cells are basically called follicular cells. And then there are going to be active cells. And by active, I mean active in producing hormones. And these are uh, cuboidal cells. 
and these are called uh, granulosa cells. So basically our follicular cells are going to mature into granulosa cells that are gonna be cuboidal in shape and are going to produce our hormones. And then if you remember the fecal cells we talked about as, warm, as well, they form out of the uh, tunica albigenia and we'll talk about them and their function in just a minute if you don't recall. So the same way we talked about spermatogenesis and remember uh, in spermatogenesis, How many stages were there in spermatogenesis? Four. What would they be? Spermatogonium. Okay, I see where you're going there. Absolutely. So you think, okay, so I wasn't thinking of state, you're thinking of stages of the cells and you're absolutely correct that way. I was thinking of processes that occur. So, right, so mitosis, which then leads to what? Meiosis one. Right, meiosis one and two, which then leads to what? What happens after meiosis two, you have four cell-shaped cells so what do you have to do to make them sperm-shaped cells? Good thing we don't have an exam in like a week. Spermiogenesis. So basically three or four, if you wanna divide meiosis into two stages, those are the stages of spermatogenesis. So if we are gonna talk about oogenesis, the formation of the female gametes, it's going to start the same way with mitosis and meiosis, one and two. But are we gonna need to change the shape of the cells in this process? No. No, absolutely not. Uh, but there are going to be some distinct differences that we are going to run in in this process. As I mentioned, for starters, oogenesis begins prior to birth. When does it begin in males? Puberty. Yeah, puberty. This process doesn't begin till males uh, until puberty. In females, this begins prior to birth. Then after birth, they have all of the gametes they're ever going to have. And so if you think about it, in females after birth, there are no more stem cells no ability to make more gametes. They have all the gametes they're ever going to have. The process then shuts down until puberty. And then in puberty with the ovarian cycle, we have this process of maturing the gametes until uh, they are released in hopes of fertilization. And again, unlike males where it continues till 15 minutes after they're dead, uh, females eventually, varying in age, uh, you know, some are 50, 60 years of age, somewhere around that range. Uh, they enter menopause, uh, where this ovarian cycle stops. They stop producing uh, uh, mature gametes, or they stop releasing gametes and are no longer capable of producing offspring. All right, so. Let's go to the whiteboard. There are some big similarities and big differences.
between these processes in males and females. Uh, one of the first is the timing. As we mentioned, this process starts in utero. While the uh, baby is developing inside of mom, inside of that baby's ovaries, uh, the process of mitosis is occurring. Once again, we start with a stem cell and in the case of the female, right, where it is a spermatogonium in the male, it is an oogonium in the female. And again, it is a unipotent stem cell and that unipotent stem cell undergoes mitosis produces two offspring. And what do we know about the two cells that are produced by this oogonium uh, during mitosis? They're identical. Yep. To each other and the original. One can become the primary spermatocyte and one can become a stem cell that is capable of division. And so again, that one stem cell allows this process to continue. And from this process, we form a primary oocyte. And just like in the males, part of that process is the replication of the chromosomes. And just like in the males, our primary spermatocyte underwent what process? Interphase. True, interphase, uh, so S1, uh, pardon me, G1, S where it replicated its uh, genetic material, G2 where it made all the special proteins, and then what did it start? What division does our primary oocyte or our primary spermatocyte undergo? Meiosis one. Meiosis one. And so the same thing starts here. Our primary oocyte starts meiosis one, but it does not finish it. Instead, it freezes very early in the process, basically at prophase one. So it condenses its genetic material down, starts to break up the nuclear envelope, starts to form the spindle fibers, and then stops. And it freezes at this point. And it stays frozen until puberty. So basically at birth, as we mentioned, There are no more stem cells left. At birth, the female has somewhere around 2 million primary oocytes. Now, that doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot. How long does it take a male to make 2 million sperm? Or heck, even 2 million primary oocytes. Less than a day. Yeah, heck, I've probably done that since the beginning of lecture today. Absolutely. So that does not seem like an impressive amount till you think of, Justin, we'll do it over here as a side, as a side note. How many eggs does a female use during the course of her life? Zero to 20. Okay, uh, why do you say that? Because she might not have any kids, but she might have a lot of kids, which- Oh, I like that, absolutely. So, okay, you're absolutely correct. So definitely one way to think of it is in terms of the number 
of times that she was pregnant. You're right. Technically, if you've never been pregnant, you've never used the eggs. Absolutely. And I mean, unless you're a dugger, you probably haven't had more than a couple. But there are those that have had a lot. Absolutely. So that's definitely one way to think of it. And I like that number, zero through 20. But let's use use in a different way. Let's think of use in terms of ovulated. So let's change the wording of this. How many ovulated in a lifetime? So that way we don't have to worry about whether it's fertilized or not. We can just say how many she's actually released. What would that number be? 500, how do you come up with that? I like that. Are you just guessing or did you do the, oh, the textbook? <laughs> Okay, I like that. Well, let's think about it. On average, how many a month does she release? Four. A month? Oh, sorry, sorry, one. One a month. So that means 12 a year. And again, I appreciate that this is a rough estimate, but that works. How many years is a female sexually viable for? Like 30? Well, so when does it start? When does when does puberty typically start for a female? Age 11? 11, 12. We'll go 12. We'll split the difference. All right. So for 12 till when? 50. 50. Heck, let's make it 52 just to keep the number round. So that gives us about 40 years. 40 years times 12 works out to about 480. So there you go. Right about 500. And again, very rough estimate. Obviously, the age is going to differ. But the point being, it's less than 1,000. Well less than 1,000. So while 2 million may not seem like a lot from a genetic diversity standpoint, when a female is going to only ovulate less than a, you know 1,000 during the course of her life, you know something like 500 during the course of her life, you still have plenty of diversity. You still have plenty of spares. There is more than enough there. Uh, to propagate the species. And that's what we really care about. All right. Then at puberty, that primary oocyte completes the meiosis one. And when it completes meiosis one, how many cells does it produce? Two. So it completes meiosis one, form two cells. We know, just like the sperm, these are going to be haploid cells. Oops, let's change that. So form two haploid cells. So both are going to have half of the chromosomes and are still going to be replicated. Again, just like we accept to see in the boys. However, here's the big difference. The division is not equal. One cell basically just gets half the chromosomes. Whereas the other cell gets half the chromosomes, and basically all the cytoplasm. So one cell basically just gets the chromosomes and the other cell gets the chromosomes and all of the cytoplasm. Now, this one that just got the chromosomes, is it necessarily gonna be able to produce a viable offspring? No. Right? Remember, the sperm, as we talked about, is just basically a nuclear missile. It takes its chromosomes, delivers it, and that's basically all the male uh, uh, donates to the offspring. When that egg is fertilized by the sperm, and what do we call that fertilized egg? What's the fancy name for we call an egg when it's been fertilized?
a zygote, absolutely. That one single cell, that zygote, needs to divide to produce trillions of cells to form the baby. And all the male provides to that is the chromosomes. So all the Golgi apparatus, all the rough endoplasmic reticulum, all the mitochondria, all of those things have to come from mom. So notice when you're making your gametes, it doesn't do mom a good service to split those things up. Instead, we give all of it to one cell to make that cell as viable as possible. And the other is basically just a placeholder, holding those extra chromosomes. This tiny little cell that just contains chromosomes, we call the first polar body. Whereas this other cell that has the chromosomes and all of the cytoplasm is our secondary. Oh, let's say. So notice in the male version, we get two secondary spermatocytes, but here we only get one secondary oocyte and one polar body. Now, these cells need to divide again. As we know, meiosis involves two divisions. Actually, let's take that back. Our secondary oocyte starts meiosis two, and again, doesn't finish it. It freezes at metaphase two. When all the chromosomes are lined up on the equator. And it is actually as this cell, a secondary oocyte frozen in metaphase two that the oocyte is released via ovulation. Notice when the ovary releases the egg, is it matured and ready to be fertilized or ready to become a baby? Is it ready to be a baby when it's released? No. No, it's not a mature gamete yet. Whereas obviously all of the males, millions and millions of sperm that are released are all mature sperm at that period of time. And in fact, if not fertilized, this cell never completes meiosis too. This is a completely dependent process. The only way this secondary oocyte can become a mature ovum is if it is fertilized by a sperm. If the sperm fertilizes it, then, and only then, does it complete its division. And when it completes that division, again, it is gonna form a cell that is just going to have half of the chromosomes and nothing else in it. And then it is gonna form a cell that has both mom's chromosomes, now dad's chromosomes from the sperm. And is now a mature ovum. Notice it's only a mature ovum once it's fertilized. And then of course the other cell would be our second polar body. And I gotta make that smaller so it fits. Now, of course we can't forget about our first polar body. Doesn't our first polar body wanna split as well? Probably. 
It absolutely can. Because after all, our goal at the end is to get one, two, three, four cells at the end of this process. And again, each of these would be haploid with only half the number of chromosomes. But honestly, do we care whether the first polar body divides? No. No. It can complete meiosis too, but it doesn't matter whether it does or not. So notice at its core, it's the same thing. Mitosis followed with meiosis. One division producing two identical cells, identical to the original, identical to the first, I mean, into each other. One of them becomes a primary, completes meiosis one to make two cells completes meiosis two to form four cells. But notice at the end of this process, we only have one viable gamete, whereas in the males, we have four. And there are other big differences in this process as well. But let's make sure we understand this process and then we'll get back to that thought. Let's look at the pretty pictures. Notice, as we mentioned, oh, I forgot another big point that I meant to make. I'll make it here, but I'll go ahead for consistency. We'll put it on the whiteboard too. This stays frozen until puberty. Notice at birth, we have 2 million primary oocytes. But by the time we reach puberty, that number is down to about 200,000. which again, sounds like a minuscule number, but is that still far, far more than the 500 that she's gonna use during the course of her life? Yes, yeah, so again, there's still plenty there for what the female needs to do. All right, so again, oogenesis starts in utero. Our stem cell, the unipotent, unipotent oogonium undergoes mitosis producing primary oocytes. And there's about 2 million of them at the time of birth. No more stem cells, no more ability to make new gametes once the female is born. These primary oocytes start meiosis one, but do not complete it. They freeze in prophase one, and they stay frozen there till puberty when there's two to 400,000 remaining. I guess I wrote two, here it says four. Great question. Uh, fairly late in the process, the reproductive organs don't start to develop till mid sec second trimester. So probably near the end of the, probably in the middle to the end of the second trimester would be when they, uh, when those eggs start to develop. So that would be, that would be my guess. All right, at puberty, Remember, it is the follicle stimulating hormone that is going to stimulate our ovarian follicle to begin to develop. Our oocyte grows and it undergoes that first division. However, notice with this first division, it is not an equal division. One cell just gets half the chromosomes. It's our first polar body whereas the other one gets half the chromosomes and all of the cytoplasm. And that is our secondary oocyte. That secondary oocyte then starts meiosis two, but freezes at metaphase two. And again, is 
ovulated in this immature non-functional state. It is not until, and in fact, only if it is fertilized by a sperm, will the egg actually complete meiosis II, forming our second polar body and our now mature ovum that has been fertilized by a sperm. Again, notice our first polar body can or cannot complete its division as well, giving us the four cells that we expect. But unlike the sperm, where you have four fully functional spell cells here, you have three polar bodies and just one fully functional gamete. What eventually happens to the polar bodies? Do they just break down, get reused? Yes, yes and yes. Uh, so as we will, we haven't gotten to it yet, although we think we talked about it briefly. As we mentioned, the oocyte, while it's maturing, is inside of, as I mentioned, a candy-coated shell, a protective layer on its outer surface. So what happens is when this cell is dividing, when it's forming all of these cells, it's all occurring within this shell. So inside of this shell, after it's fertilized, you can actually see all four cells in here like this. Well, remember, this fertilized egg needs to divide a trillion times. And part of that dividing a trillion times is being able to make more DNA for all the new cells. So what is an incredibly rich source of amino acids that we can break down and use the, as building blocks to make more DNA to, uh, to divide this one cell into trillions? Yeah, these polar bodies, their, their, their resources, which are primarily uh, nucleotides, will be broken down and recycled basically as this egg matures and divides. Yep, nothing goes to waste. All right, questions on that? All right, so here it is all together. And as I mentioned, a good way to make sure that we understand this, as we know, being the smart, sophisticated students that we are, when we have two related processes, how many essay questions does that uh, uh, lend itself to? Three. Three. Describe process one, describe process two, and compare the two processes. So let's do that. Again, remember, you are not required to set it up this way. But as I've always said, um, when uh, I'm doing a comparison to make sure I'm comparing apples to apples, I always want to think in terms of what is the characteristic that I am comparing for them. And then I can talk about that for spermatogenesis. And I can talk about that for oogenesis. So tell me some ways that these two processes are different from each other. Polar bodies are created in oogenesis. In okay, life. so uh, so I like where you're going with the polar bodies, but if we want to do a comparison, let's do it this way: the number of functional cells produced by the processes, right? From here. We go from one primary cell to four gametes, right? Whereas here, we go from one primary cell to one gamete and those three polar bodies. Excellent. So that's a great way. What else? How else are these processes different? And uh, females, uh, there's no ogonium after birth. Okay.
No, I spelled presence wrong, but you get the idea. What else? Oh, excellent. Timing. Absolutely. Timing of these processes. Uh, and there's actually, think about it two ways. Uh, this starts at puberty and then is, uh, and then whereas, as you mentioned, oogenesis starts prior to birth in utero. Also, this is a continuous process. When started, it basically continues until death. And it is definitely not a continuous process in females. In fact, actually it starts and stops twice, right? We go prior to birth, to birth, and then from puberty to menopause. Excellent. So that's two ways. What's another good way? How about one more? Timing. How long does it take to get from stem cell to functional gamete in males? About 90 days. 90 days. How long does it take to get from stem cell to functional gamete in females? Is it 30 days? 30? There you go. Years. At best, well, I'm not sure best is the right idea. At worst, 13 years. All right. You started with the stem cells in utero. Then she ovulates her first egg around 13 years of age. Right. Hopefully it doesn't get fertilized, but is it possible that that first egg that is ovulated could be fertilized at 13 years of age? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Hopefully it doesn't happen, but it is definitely possible. Absolutely. And then 13, the next chance would be 13 years in one month and then 13 years in two months and so on and so forth. So yeah, it takes years to get from stem cell to gamete. Absolutely. Excellent. I can think of at least two more good ones. The total amount of gametes? Excellent. What is the total number of gametes produced in a female? I get the hesitation because it totally depends on how you're counting, right? You could think of it in terms, because as we know, to actually produce a mature gamete, it has to be fertilized. So then the question becomes how many fertilized, or, uh, you know, eggs says she had, which basically means how many times has she gotten pregnant? Remember, it's possible to get pregnant and not bring the baby to term. So you, could, you, couldn't, you don't have to necessarily go by births, but how many times has that egg been fertilized? Or we could think of it as we mentioned, how many are uh, ovulated. Or we could even think of it in terms of what's the max number ever in their lives. So again, how many is fertilized? As was mentioned, let's go with the number zero to 20 because I don't know if there's anybody who's ever had more than 20 kids, but I guess you could have a lot, but that's a good round number. How many did we say would be ovulated in a lifetime? Yeah, right, around 500. And what was the maximum number? Of, what did they have at birth? How many of the immature ones did they have at birth? Primary oocytes. About 400,000? 
Uh, that was by the time they reached puberty. Remember, at birth, it was about 2 million. So 2 million primary oocytes at birth. 500 ovulated, 0 to 20 fertilized. Again, how do those numbers compare to the males? How many gametes does a male produce in the course of his life? A lot. Yeah. What was it? Uh, 500 million a day, seven days a week, four weeks in a month, 12 months in a year, from 13 to 83. All right. I think the technical number for that is a gajillion. Right. I mean, the, the, it's astronomical. It might as well be an infinite number. All right. We're talking about such astronomical differences. And there's one more big one. It may not be as obvious off the, um, off the start, but the process itself. In males, notice this is an independent process. We start at that stem cell, we get four gametes. As long as we have the hormones to regulate the process, nothing else is required to complete it. Does the female process always complete? No. No. It's a dependent process, right? This process only completes if what happens? Fertilization occurs. Exactly. It is a dependent process. This process can only complete in the female if that secondary oocyte is fertilized by a sperm. So as again, as many of you know, reproduction, like many things in life, females can't do it without us. <laughs> All right, questions on this? Again, three pretty, big, well, two pretty big processes, three pretty big essay questions. Is one of these three almost certainly gonna be on your exam? Yeah, absolutely. And we could probably throw mitosis and meiosis in there, maybe those four. This might be a good uh, group to pull one out of. So yeah, make sure you understand these. All right, so that is definitely an absolutely positively good thing to know and understand. However, as I've also mentioned, uh, our females have to be more complicated than that. So we need a few more bells and whistles. And what we need to understand now, now that we understand what is happening to the egg itself, remember, as I also mentioned, that egg is surrounded by support cells that form a follicle. And at the same time, that the egg is maturing and developing, so is the follicle. So we've talked about oogenesis, but now we can also talk about, oops, what's happening in the follicle as well. And this process of what is happening in the follicle is actually what we call the ovarian cycle. So what's happening to the follicle is the ovarian cycle. And that's what we have to talk about next. As you can see, clearly what's happening to the egg is related to what's happening to the uh, follicle, but it is an additional process that we absolutely positively have to talk about. 
Now, let's switch the screen for a second. To this scary looking monster, this is one of the tables from your textbook. Uh, and uh, while it can be intimidating at first when we look at it, if you think way back to the cardiovascular system, we had a similar type of uh, table where we went through graph by graph by graph by graph and talked about all these things that were related to each other. Right. Clearly, what we've talked about so far isn't even necessarily on here. That process of the maturation of the egg but as I also pointed out, the maturation of the egg is directly related to the maturation of the follicle. So here we have the graph that shows how that follicle matures and changes during the ovarian cycle. Of course, this ovarian cycle is controlled by the hormones of the anterior pituitary. They control the ovarian cycle. But remember, the follicle itself produces hormones. So we have ovarian hormones. And these ovarian hormones that are produced by the ovaries control the uterus. And lo and behold, down here, we have the uterine cycle. So we have two clearly related cycles, the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle, that are both controlled by hormones. And what makes this tricky is that it is the anterior pituitary hormones that control the ovarian cycle, which produces the ovarian hormones, which control the uterine cycles. So what we need to do is put these pieces together. We will start first up here. We will talk about the ovarian cycle and we will talk about the hormones that control it. And so that is what we're gonna do next. Here, we have the pretty picture that shows the ovarian cycle. I love this picture from your textbook, because I think it does a really nice job of showing all of the individual stages that we're going to talk about. And notice there are essentially eight stages in this process. However, the one point that I want to emphasize, because again, because I know some students have gotten confused by this in the past, is that the follicles do not actually move in the ovaries. They've just put all these stages side by side to show you uh, the different stages. It's not like maturation only starts in one position, ovulation only starts in one position and so on and so forth. What actually happens is this follicle here will go through all of these stages. And the next time this one here will go through all of the stages. And then maybe the next time it'll be one in the other ovary. And then it'll come back and it'll be this one here and it'll all occur at this one location. So to avoid confusion moving forward, these do not migrate around the ovary. These are just all the different stages that that, that, that follicle will undergo at that one location in the ovary. All right, I wanna come at this fresh. So this is a good uh, break point. It is 2.40, so let's go ahead and take our second break. We will restart at, uh, I guess that makes it 2.55, and I'll start the recording at that time. All right, any questions before we take our next break? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. So. Our goal now is to talk about the ovarian cycle. No, stupid capital. Excellent. And uh, for this, we need to understand some vocabulary. So again, remember the ovarian cycle really has to do with uh, two things, the maturation 
of the egg, as we've already talked about, but also the changes that take place in the follicle. So when talking about the ovarian cycle, we need to start at the very beginning. And the very beginning is to start, like we said, uh, at the time of birth. Um, actually, I'm gonna need this to be smaller to all fit on here. At birth, remember, as we mentioned, all of our eggs are in this state of being primary oocytes that are frozen in prophase one. And these are gonna be surrounded by a single layer of squamous cells. And these squamous cells, so here's our egg. And I made it big enough so that we can write in here to remind ourselves that if I were to point at this on an exam and ask you to identify what it is, you are gonna tell me that it is a primary oocyte and it is frozen in prophase one. Oh, and none of that wrote. There we go. Excellent. Surrounded by a single layer of flat cells. As I mentioned, these squamous cells, these flat cells are called follicular cells. And this entire structure, the primary oocyte frozen in prophase one, surrounded by a single layer of follicular cells is known as a primordial follicle. So all 200 million of the eggs in the ovaries at the time of birth are all in this state of being primordial follicles. Now, every month, some of these primordial follicles are going to start to mature. This is because, so at the start of the month, Our hormone, and what hormone is responsible for the maturation of the egg, the maturation of the follicle? Follicle stimulating hormone. There you go. So at the start of the month, follicle stimulating hormone levels increase. And not surprisingly, that leads to the uh, leads to the start, let's say it this way, of development for dozens of follicles. Not just one but dozens of follicles start this maturation process. The big key step that happens during this maturation process is that our follicular cells start to mature. When they mature, they become cuboidal and they start producing estrogens. Now, if this cell, again, matures and changes its state, 
then we can't call it a follicular cell anymore. So instead, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit here, uh, we'll stick with the red. We have a single layer of cuboidal cells that are starting to produce estrogens. And we now call these cells, instead of follicular cells, they are now going to be known as granulosa cells. A granulosa cell is just a mature follicular cell. But in maturing, it changed its shape and it changed its function. Now, two other things are going to start to happen at this time as well. If you remember, we'll use blue for this, a layer of cells are going to start to form out of the tunica albuginea. I'm purposely using a different color because these are not changed follicular cells. These are cells that were in the connective tissue that start to form around them. And these are the fecal cells. And does anybody remember what fecal cells do? Don't they produce progesterone or androgens? Excellent. These produce androgens. Remember, granulosa cells make estrogens, but they don't make it out of nothing. Really what our granulosa cells do are convert androgens into estrogens. That is what our granulosa cells do. So the sequel cells actually produce the androgens and then the granulosa cells convert them into estrogen. Now, at this point, our egg itself may be uh, getting bigger growing and getting larger, but it is still a primary oocyte and it is still frozen in prophase one. And this structure that we have just identified here, and I'll cheat, move that up a little bit, cheat, move this up here a little bit. What we have just identified right here is now a primary uh oh side. Oops, that doesn't need dollar being capitals. Primary follicle, sorry. So we've gone from a primordial follicle to a primary follicle. This process of going from a primordial follicle to a primary follicle can, in some cases, take over two years. I know we think of the female cycle as being a monthly cycle, but the first step of this process can be very, very slow. So remember, dozens start it going from that primordial to the primary, and it can take a long period of time. Now, that follicle stimulating hormone continues to stimulate our follicle to grow. And as it grows, we start to get multiple layers. excuse me, we get multiple layers of granulosa cells. So again, we have our oocyte. And again, they don't all perfectly align like this. This is more just me being lazy in my drawing of them. Oh, which reminds me, I forgot to draw something else. 
Hold on. Back here, my primary follicle. As we mentioned, the fecal cells are gonna to start to grow, but at the same time that the fecal cells are growing, internally in here, a glycogen rich layer, a cellular layer forms a protective barrier on the outside of our primary oocyte. This glycogen rich layer that is forming on the outer surface of the oocyte is known as the zona pellucidum. That zona pellucidum is going to continue to form this nice candy coated shell protecting that still primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. But now that we have two or more layers, granulosa cells, we now have what we call a secondary follicle. All right, you with me so far? Because if this doesn't make sense, it's about to get a whole lot worse. I'm gonna cheat and put my zona pellucidum over here because I need the space to write. So this is our goal, to get from our primary follicle to our secondary follicle. You with me so far? Yes. Okay. Here's the problem. Here's the trick, the catch to this. Remember, as we mentioned, that we are now forming these granulosa cells. And as we make these granulosa cells, the granulosa cells produce estrogen. Right? That's what we just finished saying. And as the granulosa cells increase, as they get larger, the amounts of estrogen increase. And here's the problem with that. The problem with that is that estrogen inhibits the release, not the production, but the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. We know luteinizing hormone is being produced in the um, anterior pituitary. We haven't mentioned it yet, but we continue to produce these, but they're not released anymore. And so what happens is the amount of follicle stimulating hormone decreases. And that's a problem because these follicles need follicle stimulating hormone to stay alive. Remember, dozens started this uh, process of getting to primary uh, to primordial to primary. But once we get from prim uh, primary and continue on, now it's a race. Because one of two things are going to happen. You either get enough follicle stimulating hormone to keep growing or you die. So while a handful reach this stage of secondary follicle, only one Only one matures to the tertiary follicle stage. 
right? Primary, secondary, tertiary. And that tertiary follicle is also known as the mature follicle or also known as the graphene follicle, All right? Because good old Bob Graphene was the first one who described it. So of the handful that start as a secondary follicle, only one makes it to the mature state. Now, I do wanna point one other thing out that happens here in the formation of our secondary follicle. Our follicle is continuing to grow and grow and grow and grow, and the egg's not growing at the same rate. So what's gonna start to happen is some spaces are gonna start to form, I don't like that. Some spaces are gonna to start to form in between the cell layers. You'll start to see some separation and the separations will occur and fill with fluid. This separation and filling with fluid uh, continues until we reach that tertiary or mature state. In that tertiary or mature state, I guess we have to use red for this. I haven't given myself a ton of room, so I'm gonna have to change the scale slightly. Here is, whoops, no. Here is my egg. And then I'm going to cheat and just draw this with a uh, magic marker here. There are many, many layers of follicular cells. All of these are the granulosa cells, I should say. Excellent. We still have. Arizona pellucidum. We still have, oh, I didn't draw it in the last one either. Our thecal cell layer on the outer surface. But notice all of our fluid filled spaces have collected together to form one big fluid filled space known as the antrum. When you have this big fluid filled space known as the antrum, then you have a mature follicle, a tertiary follicle, that graphene follicle. And the change in the follicle isn't the only thing that has changed either. Now, finally, with this one mature follicle, our oocyte has completed meiosis one. Oops, that doesn't need to be all in capitals. And starts meiosis two. And when it starts meiosis two, does it finish it? No, oh, it gets stuck in metaphase two. Freezes in metaphase two. And that is exactly how we would identify this cell now. It is a secondary oocyte frozen in metaphase two. And apparently I didn't make my egg big enough to fit all that in it. Still not big enough, but we'll make it work. Excellent. Now, the antrum isn't the only thing that we've given a new name to. Let's think about this. This granulosa cell right here 
and this granulosa cell right here. These two cells are both granulosa cells. What do they do? Convert androgens to estrogens. Exactly. Absolutely. There is no difference between them, except one difference, location. And do we give things names based on their location? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The granulosa cells that wrap around the egg, we call the corona radiata. Because as we all know now, corona means crown. Oops, way too big. So the corona radiata is basically the fancy name we give for the granulosa cells that are wrapping around the egg. A crown radiating around the egg. And the reason we give them a name is because at about day 14 of the cycle, something magical happens. Remember how before we said estrogens were inhibiting the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. But that only occurs at low levels. Estrogen reaches a peak level. And when it reaches that peak level, that estrogen triggers the massive release of all of those stored up hormones. Yes, we get an increase in follicle stimulating hormone, but the big deal is we get a huge spike of luteinizing hormone. And that huge spike of luteinizing hormone triggers ovulation. When ovulation occurs, the secondary oocyte and its support cells or support structures, the zona pellucidum and the corona radiata, are released. The bubble pops, the egg is released, and basically what we're left with is this deflated balloon of the remaining follicular cells and, of course, the fecal cells that surround them. So our egg is released. With its zona pellucidum, with its corona radiata, Ovaltine occurs and it ruptures through the wall of the ovary and releases the egg. Um, if you were to randomly find an ovary on the side of the road, you could pick it up and look at it. And by looking at its outer surface and seeing the number of scars, you could actually get the relative age of the person who dropped it. Because obviously the more scars, the more ovulations that have occurred, and the older the individual is. And as we mentioned, the ovary does contain nerves. There are some women who actually are able to experience, feel that ovulation occurring. They feel it like a little minor pinch in their side. Some women go most of their life without even being aware of it. When I was an adjunct teacher many, many years ago, I, was teach I taught at Woodland for a year. And when I was there, the department chair in the biology department was trying to get pregnant. And it wasn't until she was monitoring her cycle and they were trying to get pregnant that she realized that, you know, that little pinch she felt every once in a while in her side, never thought anything of, was actually her ovulation. And not surprisingly, when she figured that out, it was very easy for her to get pregnant. I actually have a, I, I don't know what uh, the medical term is, a German name for it, middle spurts which basically just means middle pain um, that they feel. Um, but yeah, so there are some people who actually can 
feel that tactile experience of the rupturing of it. Now, the egg is on its mystical, magical journey at that point. But remember, there is a massive amount of luteinizing hormone. And as the name luteinizing hormone means, it luteinizes something. And what it luteinizes is the remaining granulosa cells. What's left over of the follicle is converted into this big, huge glandular mass. So the remaining cells of the follicle are converted by the luteinizing hormone into a structure called the corpus luteum. And if you remember from when we talked about the endocrine system, the big difference between the corpus luteum and the granulosa cells is the corpus luteum produces both estrogens and androgens. Remember, estrogens, as we talked about, are the womanizing hormone, the maturation of the egg, all of that. Oops, sorry, estrogens and progestins. Progestins, primarily progesterone, is the hormone that tells the female's body, hey, an egg has just been released. We could get pregnant any second now. Get the body ready. It's a big, huge warning bell that goes off. And so it produces a massive amount of progestins and a smaller amount, but still some estrogens as well. And that's great. It helps to get the female's body ready for pregnancy if that egg gets fertilized. However, the estrogen and progesterone, and I'll just write it here as E and P, the estrogens and progesterones, they inhibit both production and release of follicle stimulating hormone. And in this case, what we care about is luteinizing hormone. And without that luteinizing hormone, we can not contain or maintain, sorry, cannot maintain the corpus luteum. And it degenerates. And eventually shrivels up and becomes scar tissue. Called the corpus albicans. Once it's a corpus albicans, no more production of estrogen and progesterones. So no more inhibition. And with no more inhibition, we can start making more follicle stimulating hormone. We can start maturing the primordial follicles into primary follicles and the process continues. And just that simply, we have identified the stages of the ovarian cycle. We've done it on the board and hopefully I've made this simple, but let's look at the pretty pictures. Let's go through the whole thing again with the pretty pictures from the textbook and see if we can make sense of this. Again, ovarian cycle basically occurs in two stages, the follicular phase and the luteal phase when we have the follicle and when we have the corpus luteum. And notice the dividing point is day 14 because what happens around day 14? Ovulation. Ovulation. Now, we've got a relatively small class here and even with just the few students we have in here, does every single woman in this class have exactly a 28 day cycle? No, I wish. <laughs> you wish, does that mean yours is too fast? It was faster or slower than that? It's just irregular. Oh, okay. Well, 
And that can happen both uh, consistently with a person or between people as well. Where it is most variable is in the follicular phase. So people who have shorter or longer uh, cycles typically have a shorter or longer follicular phase. The luteal phase, the point from when ovulation occurs to when menstruation begins again, this is much more stable. So the variations that you see in cycles are typically due to variations in the follicular phase. Again, it, your book divides it into eight steps. Notice my drawing only had seven, but I'll show you why and explain why in just a minute. Here is, and let's move us over to here so we can see the pretty pictures. Here is our beginning stage. Notice here we have a single cell surrounded by a single layer of flat cells and another single cell, flat layers, another single cell, flat layers. These are all examples of our primordial follicles. And notice these primordial follicles are not just randomly distributed throughout the ovary. They're clustered together. And what do you think we call a cluster of eggs? about a nest. These primordial follicles hang out in nests. And because I guarantee it's a question on the lab exam, identify the cell B specific. Primordial follicle. That's the entire structure, but identify the egg, uh, pardon me, identify the cell B specific. And don't say okay. eggs. What is it? Primary oocyte? Mm -hmm. Oocyte. Oh, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Primary oocyte. You get partial credit for that. But to be really specific, it's a primary oocyte that is what? Frozen in prophase one. Perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. A primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. Notice it is surrounded by a single layer of squamous cells. These are follicular cells. And then you are correct to go back to the original answer that we got. This entire structure would be a primary, pardon me, a primordial follicle. However, notice in this nest, one of these things is not like the others. Notice here we have a cell that, yeah, the cell is a little bit bigger, but what else do you notice about this cell? The surrounding cells are um, enlarged, became simple cuboidal. Excellent. Those are indeed simple cuboidal cells. How would we identify these simple cuboidal cells? Granulosa. Granulosa cells. And what would we call this entire structure? Primary follicle. Exactly. Excellent. And so that's what happens. Each month, some of these primordial follicles start to mature. And that single layer of flat cells becomes a single layer of cuboidal cells. Like I said, it can take well over a year or two for them to reach this stage. It can be a very, very slow process. However, once they reach this stage and they continue to mature, remember, as we talked about, the race is on at that point. So again, we still, the egg has gotten bigger, but it still hasn't changed. It is still a primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. But what has changed is its follicle. Now we have the single layer of cuboidal cells. And notice also, as we talked about, you can start to see the formation of that zona pellucidum, that uh, glycogen rich layer on the outer surface. And you notice also you can see start, start, blah, blah, blah. You can start to see some of the surrounding cells starting to condense on the outer surface, starting to form that fecal cell layer as well. 
So our zona pellucida and our thecal layers start to form here in our primary follicle stage. Again, the fecal cells jobs are to produce the androgens and then the granulosa cells convert them into estrogens. And as we mentioned, at this point, the race is on. As our follicles get bigger, and notice now we have multiple layers of granulosa cells in this secondary follicle, two or more cell layers, secondary follicle. Again, still a primary oocyte frozen in prophase one, but as we have more granulosa cells, we produce more and more estrogen. And the problem with that is that estrogens inhibit the release, not the production, but the release of follicle stimulating hormone. So now follicle stimulating hormone is a more rare resource. Some follicles are gonna get more than others just by dumb luck, or maybe they're closer to a blood vessel, or maybe the cells are more sensitive to the follicle stimulating hormone. So even a small amount of follicle stimulating hormone can stimulate them to grow. Whatever it is, typically one follicle is going to ultimately outcompete all the others. So of the handful that get to this stage, only one is gonna survive and the rest basically are gonna be broken down and be reabsorbed by the ovary. Again, once you reach that primary stage, it's win or die. You can stay a primordial follicle for years and years and years and years. But once you reach that primary stage, you're either gonna win or you're gonna die. Now, notice your book has stage three and stage four, both as the secondary follicle. Notice what they've shown you here is here, as the cells continue to expand, we start to get those fluid filled spaces that start to form between the granulosa cells. But notice whether that's there or whether that's not, it's still considered a secondary follicle. So I don't really think of it as a different stage. Your book uses it as a different stage, but I don't care whether you do or not. It's still a secondary follicle. When it's different is here. Notice when all those spaces come together into a single big fluid filled antrum, that's when you have your tertiary or graphene or mature follicle. One follicle reaches this point. One egg completes meiosis one. and starts meiosis two and freezes in metaphase two. And notice that secondary oocyte frozen in metaphase two now has some of those granulosa cells wrapped around it. Again, no difference between this granulosa cell and this one over here, except location but these wrapped around the egg, we call the corona radiata. Notice also at this late stage, you can very, very clearly see that zone of pellucidum. You can clearly see that glycogen rich layer that does not have any cells in it. It really has this thick candy coated shell on its outer surface. And looking at how massive this follicle, only one follicle one, but it's massive. And so it is producing a massive amount of estrogen. 
And this is significant because when that estrogen reaches that critical point, it causes a huge release, a huge spike of our luteinizing hormone. And I love this picture where they actually captured that popping of the bubble, you know, releasing of the egg surrounded by its zona pellucidum and its corona radiata out of the edge of the ovary. So we have this huge spike of luteinizing hormone and ovulation occurs. Hopefully, the, open, uh, the egg enters the uterine tube, where hopefully it will be fertilized. And our follicle is gone. Now, there are still some follicle cells remaining, but remember, they are going to be converted by our, corp, uh, by our luteinizing hormone into the corpus luteum. Notice here, as I mentioned, it really does kind of look like a popped balloon. But as it thickens and swells, it be can become a big, large, solid object. That corpus luteum is a huge endocrine gland that produces estrogens, just like the granulosa cells did. But the big difference is it produces those progestins those warning bells to the female body that the egg has been released and fertilization could occur any minute now. Professor, I have a question. I have an answer. Well, I, I don't know if you're fami familiar with this condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. It is pretty common. And as what I understand, uh, these females are able to, uh, their follicles are getting matured, but, uh, but is not able to be released. And instead it turns into a cyst. So, and then usually uh, they are uh, prescribed, they take progesterone pills. So I'm trying to understand how that progesterone pills will help them to release their... I'm not, I'm not familiar with the condition, but I can definitely tell you what the progesterone pills do. As I mentioned, progesterone is the hormone that tells the female's body to get ready because pregnancy could occur. And in fact, if fertilization of the egg does occur, Progestins are responsible for maintaining the uterus uh, and helping to uh, maintain the blood supply, maintain the glandularization so that the egg can implant, uh, the egg can grow, and it can ultimately produce and form the uh, placenta. Once it performs the, forms the placenta, the placenta is able to provide all the hormones necessary uh, for the baby to survive, but until then, it relies on the corpus luteum. So those progestins produced by the corpus luteum maintain it during the first, uh, basically, you know, nine, 10 weeks of life. Um, so if you think about it, the, while you are growing and developing a baby inside of you, do you want to be maturing more follicles to get ready for another ovulation? No. No. And so that's exactly what happens. In fact, uh, progestin pills were the very first birth control. Basically, a female would take that pill, it would keep their progestin levels high, and would trick the ovaries into thinking, we've already just ovulated an egg, or we're pregnant right now, so we don't want to mature any more eggs. So you would take those pills for three weeks, tricking the body into thinking that uh, you were pregnant, so you wouldn't mature any more eggs, no ovulation would occur. Then you take a week off from that pill, the progesterone levels would drop, menstruation would occur. And then a week later, if you remembered, you would start taking the pill again and keep going. Of course, that was tricky because you had to remember when you stopped taking the pill and started taking it again. So then they went from three rows of pills to a fourth row of pill. You still had your three rows of progestins. And what was the fourth row? Placebo? Yeah, sugar pills. 
basically just a placeholder so that you remember to take something every morning. And so basically it's essentially doing the same thing. It's acting as a birth control to stop the maturation of the follicles. And if the follicles aren't maturing, then they can't harden and become cysts. Now, I don't know what causes the condition, but, but that would be why you would take the progestin with pills to stop it. I think they say uh, the cause is because when female has high level of tes testosterone, okay. it causes them to not be able to release their eggs and those eggs turn into cyst. And in order to release those eggs, they prescribe progesterone. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, my guess is my guess is the same way that progestins inhibit the production of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, androgens probably do the same thing. So you don't get the spike, you don't get the ovulation, but you still get the maturation. That's interesting. Like I said, I'm not familiar with that condition, but uh, but at least biologically and from what we're talking about, it makes some sense. Thank you. Excellent. That's great. No, great. Thank you for asking that. That was really awesome. Thank you. All right. So as I mentioned, this corpus luteum gets huge, gets big, starts producing and releasing progestins and estrogens, getting the body ready for pregnancy. But as I also mentioned, if the egg isn't fertilized, then our corpus luteum's uh, estrogens and progestins inhibit the luteinizing hormone and luteinizing hormone goes away. And without luteinizing hormone, we can't form the corpus luteum. And notice we go from a big cell dense, dark dense granular structure to basically this clear acellular scar tissue, which is why it is called the corpus albicans. It's just a little, little white piece of scar tissue that is now there where there's no more cells. And obviously if you have no more gland cells, you're not producing any more estrogens and progestins, those levels drop. And without those hormones anymore, our follicle stimulating hormone is no longer being inhibited and the new cycle begins. So there you go. Our follicular phase, again, we start with the primordial follicles. They mature into primary. They mature into secondary. Again, secondaries can start to have those gaps that form, but it's not till they all fuse together into one big antrum that we get the tertiary. Then ovulation occurs. And then we have the formation of the corpus luteum and then the degeneration of the corpus luteum. And then the process begins again. Questions on that? All right. So notice now, All right, we've gone from a primordial to a primary, to a secondary, to a tertiary, to ovulation, formation of the corpus luteum, degeneration of the corpus luteum, corpus albicans, and then the process begins again. And notice, as we've hinted at, this process is controlled by the hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary, but this follicle produce hormones, estrogens and progesterones, Justins that also not only influence the uterus, but also influence the anterior pituitary. So notice this is far more complicated of a system than what we saw in the males. But let's see if we can tease this out. All right. Uh, yeah, we do this. How are we on time? Yeah, we'll do this. Excellent. All right, so let's do it this way.
Let's draw it the way they've drawn it. All right, let's think about what's happening as we mentioned. There are four hormones that we care about. Two from the anterior pituitary, and we'll use dark colors for that. Those two are luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. In our ovaries, We have our estrogens. Oops, hold on. and progestins, primarily progesterone. Now, at day one, when menstruation is occurring, the levels of all of these are relatively low. So our luteinizing hormone levels are low, our follicle stimulating hormone levels are low, our estrogen levels are low, and our progestin levels are essentially non-existent. Now, with estrogen and progestin levels low, as we mentioned, that is gonna remove the inhibition. And so we're gonna to start to see an increase in the amount of follicle stimulating hormone and also luteinizing hormone that are being produced. All right, so with little to no With little or no ovarian hormones present, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone levels increase. All right, we comfortable with that? Now, there's obviously no corpus luteum present, so no progestins are being produced at all. But with the follicle stimulating hormone, as we know, follicle stimulating hormone and as its name indicates stimulates growth of the follicles and as the follicles get bigger what happens to estrogen levels We 
What do you think happens to estrogen as we get more granulosa cells? Increase. Yeah. We start to see an increase in estrogen levels. Now, the problem is estrogen has a complicated relationship with the anterior pituitary. At low levels, estrogens inhibit release of the hormones, but not production. So these hormones are still being produced, but they're not being released anymore. So our luteinizing hormone level kind of levels out and our follicle stimulating hormone level levels out. However, not only does it start to level up, but it can actually start to dip a little bit as well. And remember, as we mentioned, this decrease in follicle stimulating hormone is what leads to the uh, degeneration of the follicles because now only a few are able to continue to grow. Only the strongest, only the fastest are gonna be able to continue to grow. But there's still gonna be that one winner. And as that one winner continues to get bigger and bigger, our estrogen levels get higher and higher. And as our estrogen levels increase, they reach a critical point where instead of inhibiting the anterior pituitary, it actually stimulates the anterior pituitary. And so the anterior pituitary releases this massive amount of luteinizing hormone. And to a lesser extent, we get a spike of follicle stimulating hormone. And as we've mentioned, this huge spike of luteinizing hormone triggers ovulation and it converts, let's say it that way, the follicle cells into the corpus luteum. And what's the big difference between the corpus luteum and just the granulosa cells by themselves? Now the corpus luteum can start making progesterone. Yeah, we start producing massive amounts of progesterone. Now, obviously the rupturing of the follicle is going to disrupt estrogen production, but estrogen production will come back up again. But obviously ovulation and the conversion of those cells disrupts that process. At this point, the combination of estrogens and progestins inhibit both production and release in the anterior pituitary. So while we had that huge spike, now levels of luteinizing hormones start to drop. Now levels of our follicle stimulating hormones start to drop. And in particular, with the drop in luteinizing hormone, our corpus luteum degenerates. And as it gets smaller, what happens to the levels of estrogen and progestin? If you don't have any more, many workers making them, then what's gonna to happen to the amount of them that you have? So close together, huh? Yeah, they're gonna to start to drop, absolutely. So uh, estrogen levels are gonna to start to drop. Progestin levels are going to start to drop. And notice as the levels of these hormones 
decrease. with less estrogen and progestins, no more inhibition on the anterior pituitary. And so the anterior pituitary makes more follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And the process continues. The level of those start to come back up again and we're essentially back at day one. And there you go. And again, I appreciate that my drawing's not the best of this, but lo and behold, we have again, this pretty picture from your textbook. And again, notice how well this lines up. At first, estrogen and progestin levels are low. And while they're low, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone levels start to rise. However, as estrogen levels start to rise, we start releasing less follicle stimulating hormone and less luteinizing hormone. And those levels drop until our estrogen reaches that critical point. And once it reaches that critical point, it actually triggers the massive release of luteinizing hormone. And notice a spike of follicle stimulating hormone as well, but it's the luteinizing hormone that triggers ovulation and converts the follicular cells into the corpus luteum. And the big difference is the corpus luteum makes those progesterones, which the follicular cells didn't. Of course, notice this these high levels of estrogen and progestins inhibit both production and release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Less luteinizing hormone means less corpus luteum. Less corpus luteum means less estrogen and progestins until the levels drop to the point where they're no longer inhibiting, and then follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone can increase again. And around and around and around she goes. Questions on that? I have a question. What stops this process? What stops the cycle? Come on, you guys are overthinking it. I'm thinking pregnancy. Exactly, and you're thinking 100% correct. Do you continue to menstruate after you get pregnant? No, hopefully not. Yeah, do you continue to ovulate after you get pregnant? No, why? What happens? What changes? Anyone know? Uh, you just said that I forgot the progesterone levels. <laughs> You've got the right idea, absolutely. And the progesterone levels stay high. And the reason for it is when an egg is fertilized, that fertilized egg, that zygote, produces a very important hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. or after you've written it out once, which you can abbreviate HCG. -E 
what that human chorionic gonadotropin does maintains the corpus luteum. Notice up till now, the corpus luteum needed the luteinizing hormone. And so when luteinizing hormone went down, the corpus luteum got smaller. But human chorionic gonadotropin also maintains the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum stays big and continues to stay big. And if it stays big and continues to stay big, then progesterone levels and estrogen levels continue to stay big and the uterine wall stays big and ready for implantation and everything is maintained and the cycle stops. What's convenient about this human chorionic gonadotropin is a zygote, a fertilized egg, is the only thing that makes it. And as we know, hormones are released into our blood. And as we know, our blood is filtered by our kidneys. And if there's too much of something in the blood where it surpasses our transport maximum, not all of it gets brought back from the filtrate. So if human chorionic gonadotropin levels get high enough, some of it stays in the tubules and is released in the urine. And if only there was a way to test our urine for human chorionic gonadotropin. The pregnancy test? That's exactly it. You pee on a stick. Why do you pee on a stick? Because you're looking for human chorionic gonadotropin. Because if it's there, it's time to pop the cork. You are pregnant. Although I guess if you're pregnant, you shouldn't drink champagne. So don't pop the cork. Drink milk. Does the body good. Professor? Yes. Um, this is a little twist like in a different direction, but uh, I don't know if this is true, but I heard if uh, a male produce, can, oh, a male can produce human chorionic hormone um, and that is like a sign for like prostate cancer or testicular cancer. I am not familiar with that. I have not heard of that. I'm not saying that it's not true. I haven't heard of that. Uh, where I thought you were going to go with this is what I do know about human chorionic gonadotropin is about, oh God, I keep, the past two years have like kind of both taken forever and also feel like they've never occurred. So probably about five or six years ago, there was a huge, huge fad where males and females who were not pregnant were taking human chorionic gonadotropin as a supplement, uh, as Many of you may or may not know, yeah, as a diet supplement and everything else, may or may not know, when you're pregnant, you're basically a huge bundle of metabolism. You're a baby oven, basically, where you're, you know, your metabolism level is very, very high. You are, um, a female's body is more likely to metabolize fat to uh, get her nutrients to be able to convert that into energy. So, you know, People thought, you know, pharmaceutical companies thought, hey, a pill that increases your metabolism and encourages your body to metabolize fat instead of sugars. Yeah, if we can convert that into a diet pill, right? People could just be sitting on the couch and barely even exercising and still, you know, the fat just melts away and they look beautiful. And so, yeah, for, for a while there, it was a huge, huge diet trend. Obviously, as you can see, the fact that we're still not doing it five years later tells you that it ne wasn't necessarily very successful. Uh, but, uh, but that's where I thought you were going with that. So that's what I know about. So human goronic gonadotropin has been used in males before as a metabolite or as a, you know, a, a diet supplement. Um, but I'm not familiar enough with prostate cancer to be able to answer that. So, so that I don't know. I'm afraid I can't answer that one. Got it. I just read that somewhere that, um, if a doctor's worried, they'll have the male like take a urine test and interesting. interesting. Well, no, they, they, they tested the actual urine and then I read somewhere, like I read a bit more and then it said something along the lines that uh, the same chemical that's found in um, a pregnant woman's urine could also be found there. And then that's what would make the doctor realize that there's something wrong. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, again, I'm not saying yes or no. I, I don't know. I'm not familiar enough with that, with prostate cancer to be able to answer that. Uh, 
it I guess it would surprise me a little bit uh, as we will see well, a little bit later when we get to the accessory structures, the females do have an accessory gland that is similar to the prostate, the male prostate, but it doesn't play a role in fertilization the same way. So, but like I said, I know there are dozens and dozens of, of chemicals produced by the prostate. So it wouldn't surprise me. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if that was the case. Got it. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Questions on this? Any other questions? That was a great one. I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you, but that was that that was a great question. All right. I think that is everything that I wanted to get through for today. Let me see where we were at. Yep, that is exactly where I wanted to get to. So that means on uh, Thursday we will be able to finish off the rest of the female uh, reproductive system. And from there, we will then go and talk uh, development inheritance. Uh, obviously, uh, development literally is a class in and of itself. You can take a human development class. So obviously, we're not going to be able to cover all of that in one day next Tuesday. Uh, next, yeah, next Tuesday. Uh, but so what we'll focus primarily on is everything up to fertilization. So we'll talk about fertilization implantation. That will be our emphasis. And then obviously we'll fast forward to the end of the process, uh, labor and uh, delivery. So, uh, so that will be the keys for uh, Tuesday next week. And then Thursday, like I said, we'll finish off uh, the rest of the female hormones and uh, cycles and, and anatomy. All right, so that is everything I have for today. Any questions? All right. Excellent. 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 All right, guys, uh, have a good day and I will see you guys on Thursday. Two more to go. I'll see you.